Salutations, respected viewers. Uh, one of my loyal subscribers has asked me to make a video about Di Valera, and he was requesting a hatchet job on Di Valera. Well, Di Valera is someone whom I do not hold in high regard, but I would not be as harsh as uh, this chap uh, seems to wish me to be. Well, who was Edward Di Valera? He's known as Eamon, but that is not the blighter's proper name. He was born Edward, and he never changed his name by deed poll. Uh, so he was born in 1882 in uh, New York City. He's born to an Irish mother, Miss Cole. I say Miss advisedly, since she had not undergone the sacrament of matrimony. Um, who was his father? Now that's a good question. Uh, there are more suspects for that than for the, uh, for the assassination of JFK. I'm being a little flippant, but honestly we have no idea. Um, this is an era when um, unwed pregnancy was stigmatised and uh, Miss Cole's boyfriend, whoever he was, didn't marry her for whatever reason. But one thing we can be certain, um, Ed Edward de Valera's father was not a Mr de Valera. So this woman was, uh, said that she was married when she's giving birth for understandable reasons. I put myself in her shoes. I mean, she didn't want to be disgraced and insulted, didn't want her child to be terribly disadvantaged. Um, so she claimed she was married to a Spaniard named Vivian de Valera, who was running a pet shop in, the, in another part of the United States. About a month later, she announced that he had suddenly died. Now, historians have looked into this. There was no Vivian de Valera uh, living in that part of the United States at the time. And she gave her putative husband's date of birth in Spain. There was no Vivian de Valera born in Spain uh, in that year. There is no record of such a man, so uh, he was a figment of her inventiveness. And nevertheless, uh, her child bore the surname Di Valera. Um, and so when he was a toddler, he was sent back with his uncle to Ireland. He grew up in Brewery County Limerick, known as Ned Cole, as in his mother's maiden name was Cole, because he was living with that family. But his name, surname was officially Di Valera, known as Edward. So he was in Limerick, he grew up in an Anglophone family, he was raised a Roman Catholic. A high majority of people in, in Limerick are Catholic. Um, he was sincerely religious, a child of the most prodigious academic ta talent, particularly gif gifted in mathematics. A very serious-minded, rigid sort of person with a bland, inexpressive voice, spoke almost in monotone. So uh, they were not a wealthy family. He felt rather unloved by his grandparents, by his uncle. Um, and his mother married somebody else. I can't remember the, her, her second husband's surname had an English surname, and she had at least one son with that, with that person. So he wrote to his mother in the United States, will you take me back? She never ever did. So he felt hurt. It's difficult not to sympathize with him. Anyway, he won a scholarship to Black Rock College in Dublin, which is one of Ireland's most illustrious schools. And uh, whatever else you think about him, there's no doubting his academic prowess. And he went to University College Dublin in about 1900. And coming from a working class family in the countryside, going to university was, was almost unheard of. So uh, he had a stellar mind. Um, and uh, only then did he start to learn the Irish language. The Gaelic League had been effectively proselytizing for the re of Ireland since it was founded, at, uh, the date escapes me, I think it was 1881. So Dr. Hyde said that, and there was a political figure called um, Arthur Griffith around, Art or Griovatha, as he would prefer to be known, who'd found um, Sinn Féin some years before, talked about the necessity of de-anglicising Ireland, that uh, he, he um, summarised English culture as being about uh, music hall jingoism, uh, bawdy ballads, smutty seaside postcards, uh, and the like. It was very much low-brow and uh, vulgar. And there's uh, more than a grain of truth in what uh, Griffith had to say. Anyhow, so Di Valera then started to learn Irish, because even though he came from the west of Ireland, um, he didn't speak any Irish. Um, which tells you how, how far the, the um, English language had spread at that stage. He came to love the Irish language so much so that he married his Irish teacher. He was an adult when he was learning it. And I think she was a couple of years older than him. So he had five children, if memory serves. Um, so he joined the Irish Volunteers, which was founded in November 1913 there to ensure that Home Rule was, was brought in and defend the liberties of all the people of Ireland, so it said. So um, July 1914, um, the uh, Irish Volunteers got guns, landed in Dublin uh, from, ooh, was it Asgard or was it Ord? I always forget which one's which. I believe it was Asgard. Um, landed at Hoth in particular. The gun running by Erskine Childers uh, and others. So he was involved in that operation and he, he'd acquired a sort of middling rank in the Irish Volunteers 
and there was the split in September 1914, and he stayed in the group that called themselves the Irish Volunteers, not the Irish National Volunteers, which soon disappeared. That was much the majority faction, Irish National Volunteers, who heeded the call of the Home Rule Party, John Redmond, saying we will uh, fight wherever the firing line extends. The First World War had broken out um, in August 1914. Well, certainly the British Empire had been drawn in by the 4th of August, and September 1914 was Redmond's fateful street speech at Woodenbridge. Um, and in that oration, he said that the, the Irish volunteers, which he didn't actually control, but had some influence over, should join the British army and fight for the freedom of minor nations. Um, so then there was the Easter Rising in April uh, 1914. Now, Di Valera, oh my goodness, I'm not sure if he was in the IRB, Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is a clandestine organisation, whereas the Irish volunteers existed openly, paraded with their illegal rifles up and down the streets, and talk about softly, softly. The Crown Forces saw this and did nothing about it. So, couldn't be further from tyranny. The uh, Crown Forces allowing the law to be held in abeyance, not enforcing it. It just shows how incredibly free we were, almost anarchic, especially considering there was a time of a life and death struggle, the way millions of people were being killed. And I mean millions in the First World War, yet still the government did not confiscate illegally held firearms. Anyhow, so the Easter Rising kicked off on the 24th of April 1916. Um, I'm not sure if, if, if he had any foreknowledge of that, but anyway, he was commander of Boland's Mill. Uh, it, was a, it was a post seized by, um, uh, by the Irish Volunteers. It soon became known as the IRA, Irish Republican Army. Um, Boland's Mill, I'm not sure if it was any, any particularly important position. It was just a fairly large building south of the Liffey, quite far to the, uh, to the east, because Dublin is sort of a, a letter C shape around Dublin Bay. Um, uh, now, so there was some intense fighting as some men who'd landed at Kingston, British soldiers, uh, Kingston's now Dunlera, marching in towards the city, who was fighting against them. Um, now, De Valera strove to suppress this, but he had a nervous breakdown during Easter, Easter week. He uh, crawled into a corner, rolled himself up into a ball, and was a gibbering wreck. Couldn't make sense for a couple of days. Um, but anyway, uh, he, his uh, stalwart disciples, and he had a few, they threatened people, you'd never breathe a word about his collapse, about when his nerve cracked, or we'll kill you. So that remained a secret for decades. It's really after his death that that came out. Read Tim Pat Coogan on that one. Anyway, he was the last commander to surrender, and uh, he struck a truculent pose. You can see him scowling uh, when he was under arrest by uh, the Crown Forces. Oh, he was also a very lanky man, the Longfellow, as he was known. He was something like six foot four. And uh, the thing is, he's an American, of course, because he was born in the United States. And uh, the British Army commander, I can't remember his, his name, said, no, we'll spare him. He was put through a court-martial sentence, sentence to death, but they decided not to kill him because they didn't want to antagonise the United States. The USA was neutral in the First World War. Um, the United Kingdom very badly needed American help, at the very least to buy weapons from neutral America. Um, and what was the other thing is, however, was being American, is that really what swung in his favour? Tom Clark had been a naturalised American. That didn't stop him getting a lead injection. Uh, so then he was sentenced to, my goodness, I don't know how long in prison, but uh, incredibly, only a year later, he was set free. So this is the thing, it shows just how exceptionally lenient uh, the Crown was. It was just unexampled leniency in time of war to let people out who'd staged an armed rebellion, killed hundreds of people, and you're going to let them go? So we were incredibly free. They've always been so compassionate, uh, the Crown in Ireland. Uh, so uh, then he stood for election to Parliament, and indeed he was elected, initially actually for the Liberty League rather than Sinn Féin, but he joined Sinn Féin. He pretty soon became president of Sinn Féin. Arthur Griffith, who founded Sinn Féin in 1904, if I got that right, he was persuaded to stand down. Remember, he'd want a dual monarchy, first of all, as in the King of Ireland would also be King of Great Britain. Well, that's what we'd had prior to 1801. Um, and he was looking at the Hungarian example, which is also particularly pertinent as the First World War was on, um, and would the Austro-Hungarian Empire survive that? Anyway, so uh, Sinn Féin would have us believe that in Ireland we were a belligerent in the First World War, except on the central power side. The United States came into the war in April 1917, and uh, Sinn Féin had a quick rethink about that one, and obviously they had absolutely no authority whatsoever, but suddenly decided that we were neutral. Um, and he started calling himself Pre of Era, which he sometimes translated as president, not Era as in Ireland, but A-I-R-E, possibly mispronouncing it.
Um, so then he was trying to make a nuisance for the Crown forces through the First World War, anti-recruiting campaign, all this kind of thing. Of course, Defence of the Realm Act, there was extraordinary security legislation. Well, I'll fast forward, cut to the chase. May 1918, the German army's been driven back. Kaiser's Schlacht has failed. And um, the Germans were uh, casting around for some desperate gambit to save themselves from defeat. Could they stage an Easter Rising again? I know Easter had gone, but something similar. Send some weapons, maybe send a few German officers, as they hadn't done in 1916, get something going. Um, it didn't get through. It didn't happen, actually. But the Crown intelligence got a hold of this, and they arrested some Sinn Féin leaders again, lest there be another insurgency, unsurprisingly, because they'd been um, just so incredibly softly, softly, kid gloves treatment until 1916, and you see what happened. So there's obviously decided that being merciful, that deciding not to enforce the law doesn't work. Uh, anyway, he was imprisoned in strange ways in Manchester, and he was later busted out in 1919. Well, by that time, the first one was over. Uh, um, January 1919, uh, 19, well, Doyle Aaron met in the Mansion House in Dublin. So December 1918 had been an election to the Parliament of Westminster, uh, for which Di Valera had been elected. He had stood in four separate constituencies, which is allowed. I can't remember. East Clare, I think, was the one he was elected for. Um, Remember, he's leader of Sinn Féin at this point, and Sinn Féin's policy is, uh, well, they want a republic, but they would allow the people of Ireland to choose whatever form of government they wish, as in they, they weren't ruling out a monarchy. Um, so then, because on the basis of Sinn Féin getting 73 out of 106 Irish seats, they claimed that that was it. This is a mandate for Ireland to leave the United Kingdom to become a republic. There was a great want of logic to that. Obviously, Sinn Féin had brutalised their opponents in the election. They had cast bogus votes. They tried to prevent valid votes being cast, things like that. They'd uh, viciously attacked the Home Rule Party, they'd murdered a Home Rule activist in Glenty's Donegal, and so on. Um, uh, Tom Barry's wife says that she voted early and often in that election, that was voting the dead, all the rest of it. So uh, then, January 1919, uh, conflict kicked off, particularly in the south of Ireland, uh, killing uh, Royal Irish Constabulary officers, and... Sinn Féin initially said, oh, nothing to do with us, we were much disapproved, please stop it. But anyway, it built up a momentum, and after a few months, they endorsed it. And that was that. So Di Valera, he was out of prison, he went to the United States to raise money, to raise publicity. Initially, they'd wanted to go to the Versailles Peace Conference, which is a completely moronic claim. First of all, well, we were, Ireland was represented in Versailles because we were part of the United Kingdom. There were Irishmen there. Um, but if we are to go as a separate country, we have to be on the losing side. We're on the German side, Sinn Féin said, right? It's obviously just so asinine. So if we lost, we have to give away territory, pay reparations, have our army restricted. What? So if we're neutral, as Sinn Féin couldn't make their mind up, they're always contradicting themselves, well, then we don't go to the peace conference. All right. So um, anyway, so finally, July the 11th, 1921, the truce was agreed in Ireland, and that was that. He returned to Ireland. Negotiations opened, various Sinn Féin members of Parliament were invited to, Lo to, to London, going to Downing Street, negotiating with Prime Minister Lloyd George. Um, Di Valera, why didn't you negotiate yourself? He did visit Downing Street, but he, he put Michael Collins in charge of the, of the, the, the delegation. He was plenty potentially. And he was aware of what was going on, because um, who was it? Um, McBride, Sean McBride was going back and forth at weekends, adolescent he was then, carrying dispatches. The treaty was signed on the 6th of December, and Di Valera decided it wasn't good enough. The Sinn Féin delegation came back to Dublin. Carl Brew said they should be arrested on the spot for high treason. But anyway, Doyle Aaron voted in favour of it. Remember, it was, it was a one-party state. Every single member of Doyle Aaron, every, every single Tochter de Dollar, was a Sinn Féiner. And that was that, but the majority did not have right to be wrong, said uh, Di Valera. There was an election, the pro-treaty side won something like 75% of the vote in the 26 counties, obviously in the north, with mostly pro-treaty, mostly unionists. The Home Rule Party there was for it, and indeed half of Sinn Féin was for it, and Northern Ireland Labour Party. So then there was obviously the Irish Civil War beginning on the 22nd of June 1922, um, and um, Di Valera was on the anti-treaty side. So Michael Collins, who'd been head of the IRB, even he thought he was swearing an oath of loyalty to George V, and uh, he thought it was good enough. So Di Valera, he lost in the Easter Rising, just as he lost the, the Irish Civil War, there he was attacking democracy in Ireland yet again. He wasn't the most extreme on that side. Although he was against the treaty, he would agree with parts of it. He suggested document to external association with the British Empire. 
Was that a concession or did it recognise there was some advantage to being connected to the mightiest empire on the globe? So he was, he was caught again. Michael Collins shot dead at West Cork. Was Steve Valera something to do with this? I go with the cock up rather than the conspiracy theory. I mean, people being shot all the time. There's a civil war on, for goodness sake. So I don't think they lured him to West Cork on the basis of parting with Di Valera. I think that would just happen to be in the area. I mean, Di Valera could have been shot and the Free State Army got to him. That was that. He was captured again. Could have been executed, but wasn't. Let out only a year later. You see how... People are just so merciful to Republicans in Ireland who are so vicious to everybody else. So we have to be firm with these people. And then um, he was wanting to get himself arrested and going to the north to stand. There was a banning order out against him because he was known to be a troublemaker, be wanting to attack democracy in Northern Ireland. Um, so he was, at, he was elected to Doyle Aaron in the south, but in order to enter, one had to take an oath of blood to George V. Would he do this? He agonized over that one. So he proposed that they would, remember? Michael Collins had done so, um, but Sinn Féin narrowly voted against it. Remember the pro-treaty people call themselves Cum and the Gale. That's evolved into Fine Gael since. Um, so he split off from Sinn Féin and found that Fianna Fáil, as in Warriors of Destiny, his own party, they took the oath of George V, they entered Doyle Aaron, and in 1932 they won the election. He was Taoiseach, and he stealthily abolished our, the monarchy in Ireland. Remember, George V was King of Ireland, as well as King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And he appointed a new governor general, Donald Obukula, who agreed to um, be virtually invisible, to live in an ordinary house, to make a mockery of the governor generalship. And that was that. He soon started the economic war. We're outnumbered by Great Britain 20 times to one, sacked tariffs on them because he was refusing to pay land annuities. So Cotius had been able to compulsory purchase the land they were renting way back in the 1880s, well, since the Wyndham Land Act. So, as we were the sport child of the British Empire, nobody ever else got, nobody else ever got that. In no other place were tenants allowed to compulsory buy it from private landlords, and the government would pay for that up front, and people just had to pay it back over time. Um, so, it was a moronic thing to do and caused great hardship. What an economic failure he was. Our, our economy was stagnant, there was high unemployment, there was severe poverty. A lot of it because, obviously, from 1916 to 1923, Dee Valera and his mates had absolutely been trashing Ireland engaged in sectarian murders and burning down some of the finest uh, architectural gems in Ireland. Anyway, who was somewhat involved in the League of Nations and anti-imperialism, supporting the Spanish Republic, despite it killing thousands of Catholic clergy. Uh, it's just staggering, the hypocrisy. Um, then the, f the Second World War came along, and one of the few things I thank him for was remaining neutral. Um, so that was that. Well, there could be no firmer proof that uh, error that's the south of Ireland, that we were not part of the United Kingdom, or we were a dominion of the British Empire, but we were allowed to plough our own furrow. We're not obliged to go to war beside the UK. Indeed, in, in October 1938, he secured an enormous concession at the Treaty Ports. The Treaty of 1921 had said that Bearhaven, Loch Swilly and Spike Island would all remain in the hands of the Royal Navy. And the Crown Forces be allowed to take back aerodromes and more ports, ports in time of war or strained relations. Neville Chamberlain had given away for almost nothing, well, for nothing, for an end to whatever the economic war, which was hurting, which was hurting um, uh, us far more than it was the UK. So that was that. A, there were two public offers to De Valera that he could get Northern Ireland during the, 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 the Second World War, and he said no both times. So it shows just what dishonesty and hypocrisy there is, what perfidy on the behalf of nationalists. When it's offered on a plate, they say no, they don't actually want it. It's this totem. People pay lip service to this shibboleth, the most that we must have a 32 county state. Um, uh, as Churchill had said, now a nation once again, now or never. De Valera chose never. And then American troops landed in Northern Ireland without asking him. He tut tutted at Roosevelt. Well, what would have happened? If Roosevelt had asked permission, De Valera said yes, he was no longer neutral. And if he said um, no, well, the Americans were going to do it anyway and make him look like a fool. So IRA men were executed under De Valera. IRA men were allowed to die on, on a hunger strike under De Valera. It shows how anglophobic many people are to execrate the uh, London authorities for doing this kind of thing, yet give De Valera a pass. And people were executed on flimsier evidence. You know, sometimes they weren't even present at the time that the person was killed. But you're chief of staff of the IRA, you're responsible for any murders carried out by your organization. De Valera had the right attitude. Um, and let, do you want to starve yourself to death? Fine, go and commit suicide then. So he lost office in 1948. Then he started his anti-partition campaign. Again, this was this nonsense that he was going on about. 
uh, it was a good drum to bang come out of uh, come out election time or when he was out of office couldn't do anything about it distract people from the catastrophic economic failure that was separation from the United Kingdom uh, there was mass emigration under him um, our economy was a disaster one of the slowest growing in Western Europe considering we, we missed out on the devastation of the Second World War we should have the strongest economy not the weakest we were even given Mar the Marshall Plan to help us so it, it really um, underlines my view that leaving the United Kingdom was catastrophic and moronic. So he was back in office pretty soon and he cracked down the IRA, brought in internship again. So Irish Republicans, they don't denounce him as they should do for being an absolute traitor to their cause. Um, and again, it's yet again, it's anglophobia, it's sheer racism against the English. If the English do it, it's unacceptable. If the Irish do it, it's um, entirely okay. Uh, but I, I, I thank him for bringing in internment and saving countless lives. Um, so there's a virtual theocracy under him. The 1937 constitution, that had been his baby, um, recognising the special position of the Catholic Church at the time. It was a pretty low turnout, but it was passed, uh, his, his constitution. Uh, so uh, what else could I point out about him? He named his son Vivian, based on the myth that his father was, uh, was Vivian. But um, I think he knew he was born outside of marriage. It doesn't reflect any dis discredit on him. And that's perhaps one of the reasons he didn't go for ordination, because this is how bigoted the church was. If you're born outside marriage, you needed a papal dispensation to become a priest. So why should only be discriminated against? Because they're born outside of marriage. That's no sin, but you have a rule. But of course, the rule can be broken if the Pope likes you. What? How illogical is that? So, but um, anyway, the laws re reflected what the Catholic Church would want it to be. There was quite strict censorship, all the rest of it. No contraception, no divorce. Um, yeah, so he was re-elected in 1966, the, the Golden Jubilee year of the Easter Rising. He was there at the commemorations. Um, and he'd gone blind by this stage. So uh, his wife died in the early 70s. He retired in 1973. He died in 1975, that August. The man, well, he was an era. He really uh, was nationalism incarnate. Dr. Hillary, one of his successors, said that de Valera was extraordinarily conservative and had stayed in office too long. It was a gerontocracy. Um, and that the, the separatist generation, or the revolutionary generation of 1916, yes, they were revolutionary insofar as they wanted to split us away from our kith and kin next door. But apart from that, they were reactionary in some respects. Um, so uh, that was him. He kept us neutral, kept us out of the Cold War, partly because, oh, we want Northern Ireland back. But, you know, this wasn't going to make much sense. If a nuke dropped in Great Britain, there was only 20 kilometres between Great Britain and Ireland, it was going to impact us just as much. And, you know, it could have stimulated our economy to be in NATO, get lots of American bases there. There was a certain logic to trying to keep out of a world war. So I loathe them for all sorts of reasons, for holding Ireland back, for splitting us from um, our friends and our neighbours in Great Britain, for um, I said, running such a stifling theocracy for the economic disaster that it was. As I say, we kept us out of the Second World War. Perhaps if we brought us in, that would have healed the wounds with the North and stimulated the economy, got more troops in, and it shortened the war by one day. When the Germans bombed us a few times, that was provocation. Our merchant ships were sunk by them. The Luftwaffe bombed Belfast, killed 800 people in one night. I don't blame the Luftwaffe. There were no, there were no smart bombers. They weren't trying to kill civilians. But if we really believe the North is ours, then we're duty bound to defend it, not to do nothing. So um, uh, he was a hypocrite and a bigot and a disaster, almost unmitigated from first to last.